Welcome. My name is Andrew Miller. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Avast or ABG Business. And today's webinar is on Stop Ransomware Before It Destroys Your Client's Data. We've got uh, Ken Shaw from Memberscale presenting the webinar today. And today's webinar is part one of three. So this is a three-part series. The invitation that you were sent that got you here also includes registration links for the other two parts. Small piece of housekeeping, there will be a follow-up email will go out uh, within the next 24 hours which will give you a link to the recording of this webinar. It will give you links to part two and three, and also give you a link which will allow you to go to a deep dive technical demonstration of Infrascale. So uh, but that's the housekeeping part. In terms of today's webinar, um, we've got three parts to it. The first part is the evolution of ransomware. It's, under, it's something we need to understand where it came from, what it's doing, how you can protect against it most effectively. Then Ken's going to go through a three-step approach, which is a, a nice layered approach to protect against ransomware. And we're going to leave time for uh, questions and answers. So at any point during the presentation, please use the Q&A pod, type in your questions. We have a couple of moderators who will be answering some of those questions in real time. Uh, some of those questions pertain to slides later on in the deck, so we may defer some of those answers. And at the end, we'll go through and clear everything. So that's what we're going to be doing for the webinar itself. Uh, I did mention Ken's name once. And uh, Ken is the founder and CEO of uh, Infrascale. Now, I first met Ken a couple of years ago. And when he first talked to me about what you know, backup and disaster recovery was, he was very excited about the topic. And I realized, OK, this is a man who, who understands protecting data and understands how important data is for a, not just a small business, but any business. Um, but then I noticed that he really seemed to know how to evangelize it, and then a couple of deep technical questions came in, and he fielded those just perfectly. So I kind of learned, uh, looked him up, and uh, turns out he's an engineer with a sales bent. So deeply technical, passionate about his craft. Uh, his career started in uh, data protection, and it stayed in data protection, you know, the backup and disaster recovery. And he's built a, uh, a company on it, starting with two employees, now up to 100. So this is a man who's an expert in this field, and we're lucky to have him with us today to uh, go through with this webinar. So let me um, just go on to the next slide, and uh, Ken, please take it away. Terrific. Thanks for that introduction, Andrew. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> Those are very kind words. Uh, good morning, folks. Well, actually, good evening. Uh, this is a European webinar. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you, AVG. And um, here on the slide, we have our last piece of housekeeping. We've got three pictures here, an Xbox One, an Apple TV, and a Parrot drone. All very good fun. I'm the proud owner of one of each of these things. And we're actually giving these away today. We're giving them away to the person who asks the most questions um, for, uh, during the course of the webinar. I've just been corrected by one of my team. This is the North American webinar. I'm sorry, I've been doing a few of these. So uh, good, uh, good afternoon and good morning, depending upon where you are in the US. But we're giving away one of these prizes to the person who asked the most questions about the webinar during the session. So find the Q&A tool in the ON24 software and start asking questions. We will announce that winner at the end of the presentation. Okay. Oh, and by the way, there'll be a Q&A. So, of course, you know, we'll do the presentation, then we'll answer all your questions, and then we'll announce the winner. But before we do all that, I have my first question for you. Uh, and that's a pretty simple one, folks. It's have you or your clients been infected by ransomware. This is a channel-oriented webinar. Most of the people on the, on the web, uh, webinar today are going to be members of the channel. And so that's why we sort of ask, you know, have you or your clients been infected by ransomware yet? Three options, yes, no, or the third one, fairly cavalier, <laughs> ransomware does not worry me. So hopefully a few folks have voted by now. I can't actually see, with the ON24 the on software doesn't show us how many folks have voted yet. So I'll give that a few more seconds, and then let's have a look at the results. Okay, so 88% of you say yes, um, you or your clients have been hit by ransomware. 11% of you have said no, and none of you say ransomware doesn't worry you. Well, firstly and foremostly, thank goodness none of you checked option C. Um, for those 11% in the no bucket, I have bad news for you. Uh, statistically, it's almost certain that you or your clients will be hit by ransomware in the next 12 months. And for those of you who have experienced it or know someone who has, you know just how troublesome ransomware can be. So before we get into the best way to prepare yourself and protect yourself from ransomware, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the rise of ransomware, its evolution, so to speak. And it's this 
pull quote at the bottom of this slide is an interesting one where it says 91% of respondents, this is referring to a study that InfraScout commissioned, uh, which we conducted in North America. So here on the webinar, we had 88% of participants have, have been hit by ransomware or know someone who has. That's very closely correlated with the research that we've done independently. It was interesting, when we did the European webinar earlier this morning, it was 93% um, of those participants had, had experienced ransomware. So just taking a little trip down sort of history lane, a lot of people think ransomware is this brand new thing, and it's actually not. It's been around since pretty much the dawn of the personal computing era. The first known ransomware attacks occurred in 1986, just four years after IBM released the PC. Um, and early variants of ransomware were pretty unsophisticated. They would do things like move the boot sector file or, or you know, or lock a particular file that would then disable the system. Um, this would often, you know, sort of happen in a, in a corporate context. Uh, I have a friend who tells a great story about he, he was working for a large manufacturer in Australia and they fired the IT guy and the IT guy on the way out, you know, sort of locked all these files and they basically shut down, had to shut down operations for two days. Um, right, so sort of early variant of ransomware. Now that chap went to jail, right, because it was easy to track him down. And I'm going to come back to that concept of tracking down the bad guy in just a hot second. But as we sort of then progressed forward through the 90s into the noughties, ransomware became sort of hit the, hit the news radar in 2006 and then again in 2010, but has accelerated massively over the last two years. A lot of people ask me why. And after doing some thinking on this, I've, my, I have sort of three answers to the question, why is ransomware on the rise so much? And the first one is the actual, in, the older variants of ransomware are very easy to defeat, right? Once you knew what happened, then you would just move the files back to the, where they were meant to be or unlock a file, no big deal. Um, so, But with the rise of very powerful symmetric and asymmetric encryption algorithms, in the 90s, led by the US government, um, and then sort of the, the widespread adoption of these frameworks, uh, hackers got a new tool in the ransomware sort of world. They got encryption that's pretty much uncrackable, right? And there are caveats to that, and we'll talk about the caveats later, but for the moment, let's just stipulate that these new encryption protocols are almost impossible to brute force. The other thing that changed is the amount of processing grunt that is available to all of us. You know, the I'm talking to you for an iPhone 7, um, which has an A10 processor in it, and that A10 processor is far, far, far more powerful than the computer I learned to program on, and probably a hundred times more powerful than the computer my father, you know, had in his office when I was a little boy. Um, right, and that's just the, that's the computer in my pocket. When you go across to the desktop, it's now common for us to have multi-core hyper-threading processors. Why is any of this relevant? It's relevant because this means it's we, uh, the power exists inside your laptop to encrypt a terabyte of data without you even noticing it. Ten years ago, if, if your laptop was in the background encrypting all of your data, you sure would notice it because your processor would have been, you know, been crushed and the performance of your laptop would have collapsed. These days, there's so much latent processing capacity in our personal computers that ransomware could be sitting in the background encrypting away and you won't even notice it, right? Uh, you, your computer will barely break a sweat. But the, the third and biggest reason, I think, why ransomware has exploded is the promulgation of digital anonymous currencies. Uh, Ether is one, Bitcoin is perhaps the most famous, you've almost certainly heard of it. So if you think back to that story about my mate Greg and his co-worker, um, they, it was very easy for them to identify who it was who had locked their computers. And then the police went and arrested him, right? So tracking down the bad guy was trivial. With digital anonymous currencies, tracking down the bad guy has become almost impossible. And if you think about the phrase ransomware, it is sort of, um, it's, they're directly referring to sort of kidnappings in the physical world, right? And there's a kidnapping and then there's a ransom note. So the, the metaphorical equivalent is that these bad guys are kidnapping our data on our computers by encrypting it and locking it up and then giving us a ransom note and demanding payment. Well, we've all seen enough movies involving kidnapping to know that the way the, the cops usually find the bad guys is they follow the money, right? And in, frankly, in most crimes, most uh, 
white collar fraud based money crimes, the way you get the bad guys, you follow the money. With ransomware, you can't do that because Ether and, and, and Bitcoin cannot be traced back. A, a hacker could be sitting in, you know, in Irvine, California, perpetrating attacks against hospitals in Michigan. And there is no way for the authorities to track that back. Now, the chances are he's not in Irvine, California. The chances are he's in Minsk or, you know, or Moscow or somewhere else or China. Um, but he could be anywhere and uh, or she for that matter. And there's no way to track them back. So because of this, there's now an economic incentive to do this. Hacking, when I grew up, a lot of my friends were hackers. And what, certainly when I went to university, a lot of my friends were hackers. But hacking wasn't a nefarious activity and it certainly was not a lucrative activity. You didn't hack for money, right? It was, uh, it was a matter of pride. And sometimes like rat bags would involve in digital vandalism, take down a website, this sort of thing. But it was not done for an economic motive. This has completely changed with ransomware. This is now an economic activity. And in a couple of slides time, I'm going to go deeper on this topic. But so, so hold that thought in your head for a moment. So if you couple the, the, the sort of three technological trends uh, with the following three trends, you end up with the, the pickle we're in today. So there are three additional trends going on. The first is that ransomware has gone global. Initial ransomware attacks were generally targeted here in the United States, but it's now happening in every country in the world. Second one is that the, the bad guys have changed their target. They used to go after you know, home users. They'd go after you at home and they'd, they'd encrypt all your photos and they'd say, give me $50 and I'll give you your photos back. Well, pretty quickly they realized that if they go after someone like the Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, they will be likely to pay $17,000. And that's a real thing. That actually happened, right? So ransomware, um, the, the ransomware guys are now focusing on business in general, and they're focusing on businesses with mission-critical infrastructure like hospitals and law firms who cannot lose their, you know, their clients' data, and dental practices who rely completely upon their medical imaging systems to actually operate, so on and so forth. Um, and then the last one is the network effect. The, these tools are getting more sophisticated because this is an economic there is an economic incentive here. You've got real serious programmers writing the latest variants of ransomware. So instead of just coming in and infecting your computer, current variants of ransomware will infect your entire network, sit dormant on your computer, and then exploit as many holes as it can find throughout the entire company before it will finally pop a ransom note. Um, so sort of those three trends coupled with the, the technological capabilities we've now got that I covered on the previous slide give us some pretty alarming statistics. So let's look at the numbers. 2,900 new malware modifications were detected in Q1 of this year alone. 72% of ransomware victims are unable to access the data for two days. And here's the kicker. $209 million were paid out in the first three months of 2016. So if we annualize that, that's roughly a billion dollars being paid out in ransomware this year. Two years ago, it was a tenth of that. So a billion dollar illegal industry has been birthed. And I assure you that it's going to be much, much bigger next year. It might be a three or four or five billion dollar illegal industry. And to me, this is the, this is the heart of the problem, right? Uh, there, are, there are hackers who can, make, can easily make $100,000 a year doing this with very little effort. Um, and when there's this much money involved, you know that it's going to continue to attract more bad guys. And because businesses so frequently pay out the ransoms, you know, there's this um, very negative spiral going on where businesses pay out the ransoms, so it becomes more financially lucrative, which therefore attracts more hackers to participate in ransomware attacks, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that fairly depressing <laughs> backdrop, uh, you've got to ask yourself, what do you do if you do get infected? And you've generally got two options, right? You can either pay the ransom and hope that they're going to give you the encryption keys and hope that they're going to give you your data back. And by the way, about half the time they don't. Or you can restore your systems and your data to the day before you got infected. But that's not trivial. You have to have a great backup and disaster recovery system in place and you have to be able to determine when you got infected. We're going to talk about these things in a few slides' time. So what do we do about all this? Um, AVG and Infoscale together uh, recommend a three-step approach to protecting yourself against ransomware and being able to remediate. 
Step one is user education. The employees of your business and the employees of your customers' businesses are simultaneously your best line of defense and your weakest link. It's through their uh, actions that businesses are going to be infected, and it's through their vigilance that you can very much help your clients you know, uh, not fall prey to ransomware attacks. The other... The second sort of layer of this three-part approach is put in sophisticated antivirus protection. Uh, and Andrew will talk a little bit later about some of the new things AVG is doing. But we've partnered with AVG because they have been for well more than a decade one of the world leaders in all sorts of security, including antivirus. And so it, it's vital to implement a multi-layered approach with dynamic scanning. And even uh, AVG has even got some decryption tools that can be used. But the last line of defense, and in my book, probably one of the, the most important elements is having a great BDA backup and disaster recovery solution in place that lets you roll back to the day before you get infected. I'm going to talk a lot more about that. But first, let's have a look at some of these phishing attacks, okay? Uh, Andrew shared a statistic earlier today. 93% of phishing going on right now uh, are because of ransomware. And have a look at this Amazon email. I buy everything from Amazon, my groceries, my books, my clothes. I would fall prone to this one on the left. I mean, it's it's a well-disguised and camouflaged email where they're spoofing Amazon, and all the user has to do is click that link, and then they're going to be taken to a website where they're going to be infected with ransomware, right? This is scary, and these sorts of phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks, spear phishing is where you do a very targeted phishing campaign, right, uh, are occurring all day long, uh, driving people to pages that will infect them with ransomware so that four weeks later, the hackers can then you know, hold your data hostage. So step one in, in sort of building this defense is user education. You must go and educate the employees of your clients and your, you know, the, the boss men of your clients about ransomware. You've got to train their users. You've got to perform. You've got to get awareness going. Um, by the way, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to go and engage with your clients, show up on site, and potentially sell them additional services, sell them penetration testing services, right? Do a security audit for them, sell them BDR. So this is not just about uh, educating your clients. This is also a good way for you to engage with them from a business perspective. Uh, by the way, Wombat and FishMe are both tools that you can use to simulate attacks and see how ready your clients are. And even if you set aside the commercial motive, you've got a fiduciary obligation to your customers to go and make sure that they're prepped for this, right? And flip side, if they do get infected with ransomware, you're the one that they're going to blame, right? So you've got, a, you've got a sort of a, an, an ethical professional obligation to go and make sure your clients are prepped for this. And you have an economic incentive because it's a good way for you to engage and sell more stuff. And you have a defensive motivation, which is that if they do get infected with ransomware, you can betcha they're the one that you are the one they'll be mad with. Step two, then, after you sort of you've done the education, is make sure you implement a multi-layered antivirus solution, right? So um, that means signature-based detection, but also container observation with advanced heuristics, where we isolate files, run them, and find out what they're doing. Crowdsourced intelligence and alerting. Um, the great thing about AVG is they have all of this built into their tools both for consumers and for SMBs, and they've got wonderful centralized management tools that allow you to deploy, manage, and monitor. Uh, so if, uh, I'm pretty sure everybody on the line is already an AVG partner and therefore understands the power of their, their suite. If you're not an AVG partner, I strongly recommend that you look into becoming one. Uh, and then, of course, step three is where InfraScale comes in. Step three is the make sure you've implemented a good backup and DR strategy so you can roll back. And before I sort of dive into the details of that, let's just distinguish for a second between backup on the one hand and disaster recovery on the other. Everyone understands backup, I think. But if, if you look at this diagram at the top here, uh, if you think about with backup, we're, we're backing up data, we're protecting, we're protecting, we're protecting, and then boom, a disaster happens, right? Flood, fire, famine, ransomware attack, doesn't matter. Some sort of disaster happens. With a backup tool, uh, you get the call. It's 2 in the morning, right? It's always 2 in the morning. You get out of bed, put your boots on, jump in the car, drive down to the data center, and you start restoring data, which is effectively copying data over a wire back to your computers. That's copying data from a tape drive over a wire or a disk array over a wire or down from the cloud over a wire. But no matter what, you're going to be copying a lot of data over a wire and it takes hours or even days before you can be backed up and running. 
I was in Manhattan last week and had a few conversations with guys who were down for three weeks in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy because the restore took that long to get all of the, the, the data copied back over a while. Disaster recovery, or DR as a service, takes a different approach. Uh, and InfraScale is at sort of the forefront of what I'm about to describe. Similar uh, flow at the front. We're backing up, we're protecting systems, we're backing up, we're backing up, and then boom, disaster happens. With InfraScale's DRAS solution, DR as a service, you push a button, so you actually don't need to get out of bed. Same scenario, two in the morning, you get the call. You can roll over and grab your iPad, log into the location that's been affected, hit the run book play button, wait a couple minutes, and then boom, your data center is back up and running in the cloud. You can do that for up to 200 machines. So the whole concept of disaster recovery is that we'll be able to run our machine somewhere else almost instantaneously and not need to do any restores, right? So that's the easy way to think about the difference between backup and DR. And so both of these tools can protect you from ransomware. There's obviously different price points for backup versus DR, right? And if you are going to rely on backup, there are some things you can do to make sure it's going, that you're going to be better prepared um, first thing is make sure you look for a business grade solution, okay? You, you're not going to want to pick a Mosey or a Carbonite or, you know, sort of solutions that weren't designed for real business environments. Second thing is look for solutions that have anomaly detection built in. I'm going to talk about this later, but anomaly detection is this basic concept that the backup tool should warn you when weird things happen, right? So if all of a sudden heaps of files start changing and are being encrypted because of ransomware, your backup tool should be smart enough to detect that and tell you about it. Unlimited versioning is very important, particularly because you want to, uh, when you roll back, one of the biggest problems with, well, let me rewind. InfraScale keeps an unlimited version history, and I'll show you a screenshot of this later. But literally, all of your data, every day we keep, and, and we pay for that. You don't pay for that. Why is this important? Well, most backup tools only keep the last two weeks or the last four weeks of data. The reason why that's very problematic in the context of ransomware is ransomware will often sit dormant for weeks, right? So if you were actually infected six weeks ago, but your backup tool only stores the last four weeks, then you're in a lot of pain, right? Because you cannot roll back to the day before. And I'm constantly surprised by how normal it is for folks to only be able to roll back two or four weeks. Right, because that usually means they can't roll back to the day before. Now, if you're looking for a DRAS solution, or DR as a service, make sure you get something that you know you can run locally, but also fail over to the cloud. Uh, make sure, and this second bullet's the most important thing on this slide. Make sure you get a service that guarantees the recovery time. So, in sort of, you know, in data protection land, we call this the RTO, recovery time objective. Make sure you have a guaranteed RTO. It's quite rare, um, frankly, in the industry, but a few of us do guarantee the time to get you back. In InfraScale's case, it's 15 minutes, uh, and we believe that that's the lowest in the industry by a long way. I think the next closest SLA in the industry is two hours. Uh, so we're quite proud of that. Um, all right, so I'll talk more about our solutions later, but let's keep going with sort of the education component here. What do you do if you actually do get infected? Step one, pretty simple. Disconnect the affected machine from the network, right? Get it off the network so it can't infect others. Step two, and this one can be tricky, figure out when you were infected. A lot of people think that just because you got the ransom note today, I was infected recently. That's not true. If you get the ransom note today, you might have been infected two months ago. And then step three, roll back to the day before you were infected, okay? So step one, removing the computer from the network is pretty self-explanatory. I don't have a slide on that. Step two, figuring out when you're affected. I do have a slide on this because we've built intelligence into our tool set. So when you're backing up with InfraScale, we're using artificial intelligence and big data heuristics to analyze the patterns in your data protection workloads. And if we see something weird, for example, a lot of files being encrypted, we're immediately going to tell you, hey, Anomaly has been detected. This looks like ransomware you need to investigate right now. Um, that's a very powerful feature. I think we're the only ones in the industry that have it. Uh, again, I, I say I think because sorry, I mean I pay very close attention to this and no one else is talking about this. Uh, so this is a very powerful feature that's built in for free. 
And then the last step, of course, is turn back time. We want to go back to the, the day before the infection occurred. And so it's hard for you to see this screenshot, but what this is is a screenshot of our one of our apps, and it's a screenshot of June this year, and there's a calendar. Basically what it's saying is I can pick any day in June I want to roll my computer back to. Okay, so here we are in October. I could roll my computer back to June. That's useful. So if I was infected on June 30th, I'll roll back to June 26th, and everything's fine. But here's something way cooler. This second screenshot is showing you the month of May 2012. With that exact same account and that exact same product, I can roll my computer back to May 2012. There is no other vendor who can do this for you. But we keep an unlimited history of snapshots for you on our dime so that you can roll back a computer to any point in time. Right Now, you're probably never going to need to roll something back four years. I, I, I have that here just to prove a point. Um, but that unlimited version is super powerful. If, you're only, if your tool, if your backup tool only maintains two or four weeks, you've got a problem when it comes to ransomware because the infection period is usually longer than that. Right? Uh, what are they called? The, uh, in virology, what are they called? The incubation period. So the incubation period for ransomware is usually longer than two or four weeks. Now, if you're using DRAS, Disaster Recovery as a Service, your, your workflow is even simpler. Um, so again, you get the call two in the morning, you've been hit with ransomware, uh, so your users are now offline. You grab your iPad, you log in, uh, you find the office affected, you find the systems affected, you hit play on the run book, and then within 15 minutes, guaranteed, all of those systems are going to be rehydrated, injected into hypervisors, booted, internetworked, and made available back to your, to your customers or to your users. Very powerful technology. Uh, and so let's take a real life sort of example of, of this in action. It's a tale of two universities, uh, pun on the Great Dickens novel. Uh, University of Calgary, I think many of you would have heard this story. Earlier this year, the University of Calgary got hit by ransomware. They had a professor who had his entire career's worth of research encrypted. And they tried all sorts of tools and hired all sorts of consultants to, to crack open you know, the ransomware and, and get this research back and their backup systems were infected and they couldn't. So they ended up shelling out, I think it was $17,000. It may actually have been more than that. Um, they ended up shelling out an enormous amount of money, $16,000, I'm sorry, um, to get this research back. Contrast that with the University of Virginia. University of Virginia is a customer of Scales. So Ellen McCree, pictured here, uh, recently was the victim of ransomware. And when she was hit, she actually wasn't worried. She wasn't worried because she had Infoscale installed and she'd done a whole bunch of test failbacks. So she knew that she could get back online. She knew she could roll back. And as you can see here, her total downtime was 1.5 hours. The question is, well, Ken, why was it 1.5 hours? You say you have a 15 minute guaranteed SLA. That's right, we do. It took Ellen 1.5 hours basically to get approval from her boss to do the failback and notify the, all the users about what was happening. Then when she actually initiated the failback, it took a few minutes, right? Um, and so, you know, look at the contrast there. University of Calgary, that guy, that whole office was shut down for two weeks and then they had to shell out $16,000. University of Virginia, total downtime, 1.5 hours, right? Uh, so that's what it looks like if you are properly prepared. And the quote from Ellen was, with Infoscale, I quickly and easily recovered clean versions of our encrypted files with minimal user impact. It was easy peasy. I like that quote. Okay, so this brings us to the end of sort of the educational component. Um, and so I've got another question for you folks. When it comes to backup and disaster recovery, which of these statements best describe you? A. I'm not happy with my current backup or MDR system. B, I've got backup, but I'd like to learn more about that DRAS, instant boot, cloud boot thing, Ken, you were just talking about. Or option C, look, I'm happy with my BDR solution. I'm just here to learn about ransomware. And I'm going to give you guys a minute to lean forward and uh, click on this poll while I have a, a quick sip of my coffee. All right, let's have a look at the results. So, um, fairly even split. Um, we've got 
uh, about a third, a third, a third between not happy with my current backup of DR system, happy with my backup solution, but like to learn more about Infoscale's Draz offering, and then happy with BDR. Just got a note here from one of my teammates. Um, remember to ask questions, folks. We're giving away that, that Xbox One, uh, that uh, Apple TV, and, uh, and or that um, Parrot drone, but we're, we're giving it away to the person who asked the most questions. We don't have a ton of questions on the line there, so it could actually be very easy to win right now because not many people have asked questions. So uh, if you want to win one of those toys, um, open up the questions tool in On24 and ask some questions. All right, so moving on. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Infoscale. So Infoscale's founded on the belief that every modern company depends on data and system uptime, and they should have protection, right? All of the big guys, the Fortune 2000, have great backup and DR solutions and can fail over. But we believe that every business should have that. So we are sort of, we're, we're the Robin Hood of DR technology. We're taking the ideas of the big boy, big iron DR solutions, and we're scaling them down in software so that they can be available and affordable for everyone, right? Uh, we think this is really important. We think that the computing industry has pretty much ignored data resilience and protection and system uptime, right? Everything's been about more speed, more productivity, more digital content, and, and we've been great at making our entire universe digital, but we've been really lousy as an industry in innovating around data protection and innovating around ways to make systems sort of impervious to fault. Um, so our mission as a company is pretty straightforward. We're setting out to eradicate downtime and data loss. Um, and it's a, it's a big, meaty problem to attack. And unfortunately, it's an area that's been ignored for 40 years uh, by, by the technology industry broadly. And now finally, there's a lot of innovation going on uh, in the, the back of a disaster recovery space. So our solution, we guarantee that we can fail over your systems to the cloud and get you back up and running from any disaster in 15 minutes or less. And when people hear disaster, they often think Moses, right? They think fire, floods, famines, locusts. But that's not the most common disaster. Most, the most common disaster is some schmuck knocked the power cable out of the, you know, out of the ESX host, or some kid ran the script in the root directory instead of the user directory, or you got hit by ransomware and all your files are being encrypted, right? Um, so disasters are far more likely to be micro-technology disasters than macro-environmental disasters. Um, and we, but we will prepare you to defend against both. So uh, the three major use cases for our technology, the first is ransomware protection, which is why we're here talking about it today. Uh, second major pillar of our offering is cloud backup and recovery. We have an award-winning cloud backup and recovery suite. So if you choose to go down the backup route, we have a terrific solution for you with built-in anomaly detection, with unlimited version retention, uh, both of which are key to responding to a ransomware attack. And then the third thing that we do uh, very, very well is this push button failover, this concept of cloud boot. Boot my systems in the cloud when they're down or when they've been hit by ransomware. So, uh, oh, actually, I was, I was about to talk about some other features, but before I do that, let me just explain to you this idea of ours that we call the data value pyramid. Um, when we think about a business, we break data into four buckets, okay? So let's imagine a hospital, 500 employee hospital with three or four doctor's clinics around it that they support, okay? The endpoints are your laptops. There, if there are 500 employees, there's probably gonna be 500 laptops and endpoints to worry about. Then you've got your remote office and branch office infrastructure. This is gonna be the server inside each of those doctor's offices. Probably a, could be you know, an SBS server, for example. Then you have your core DC. This is gonna be at the hospital, usually in the basement. And then within that, you have your mission critical workloads, like your EPIC, your ERP system, right? The stuff that really can't go down. Interestingly, for most businesses, these top two rows, the mission critical workloads and the core data center workloads are usually protected today either by backup or DR technology. It's, you know, it's, it's not universal that businesses have disaster recovery in place, but backups pretty much de rigueur at this point. However, Robo, remote office, branch office, and then endpoints are very often exposed. More often than not, these are actually exposed. And by the way, this is where you're most likely to be hit by ransomware attacks, right? And so um, you really need to invest in a BDR solution that's going to it's going to span the gamut for you. That's going to protect you 
on the mission critical workloads and the core data center workloads, but also for robo and for endpoints. So Infrascale has a solution that spans this entire stack, right? Infrascale disaster recovery, for the top two, and then Infrascale cloud backup for the bottom two. And so uh, here's sort of the, some other key points about the two solutions. For cloud backup, this is a, this is a less expensive product, um, but it has unlimited version history, unlimited snapshots, built-in encryption, and that all-important anomaly detection to help you figure out when you're infected by ransomware. And then Infrascale Disaster Recovery in the green, this is all about backing up your entire network, all your servers, where we will snapshot and send a replica to the cloud so that if you were hit by flood, fire, famine, or ransomware, we can bring back your entire operation almost instantly. So, um, what else about Infrascale? Well, uh, Gartner, the Gartner Group is a well-respected technology analyst firm. Last year, uh, sort of had a look at what we were doing and awarded us their Cool Vendor Award for Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery. And I joked at the time to my girlfriend that uh, we are the coolest cats in the nerdiest industry on Earth. <laughs> but we were actually very proud of the award, right, because we, we are doing something very unique and, and very much innovating in a field that hasn't seen innovation in decades. And then this year, Gartner called, called us their visionary for DR as a service. Um, so on the left, here's the Gartner Magic Quadrant. It's a bit of an eye chart. But uh, we're right in there at the top of the visionary group. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have a vision for a very different approach to, to disaster recovery that is very affordable and that is almost instantly getting you back online. Um, so just to give you sort of a uh, point of comparison, uh, IBM is the world leader in disaster recovery, but our solution is five times faster than IBM and costs a fifth as much, right? So I like to say we're 25 times better. <laughs> um, certainly, we represent a lot more value for you. And so what do we protect? We protect all of the major physical form factors, whether that's mobile devices, and yes, we actually do back up tablets and mobile phones, particularly Android. Desktop and laptops, of course, you know, across Windows and Mac. Physical servers. Now, your physical servers these days are generally running Windows or Linux, but you may still have some Unix kicking around, and we support Unix also. Uh, or your virtual servers, the two, you know, inherent, in, sort of, uh, sorry, dominant hypervisors being VMware and Hyper-V. So we support both. And within that framework, we actually support more than 100 versions of the various operating systems. So whether we're talking about AIX as a Unix variant or Ubuntu as a Linux variant or all of the major flavors of Windows Server or Windows desktop environments, whether we're talking about VMware or whether we're talking about Hyper-V, if you've got it in your environment, there's a very good chance we support it. Um, very good chance we support it. In fact, this is probably one of our strongest selling points that no matter what the data protection challenge you come across when you visit your clients, Infrascale is going to have your back and we're going to have a solution in the toolbox for you. So another common question I get is, well, Ken, where is this data going? When you say the cloud, what do you mean? And the answer to that is that we can work in your cloud, we can work in our cloud, or we can run on any cloud. So when I say uh, your cloud, I'm talking about your own private cloud uh, infrastructure. This could be VMware clusters or Hyper-V clusters in a co-location facility you have with your own data center. Um, when I say our cloud, Infrascale maintains 15 data center pops around the world, six in North America. Um, and so you can use Infrascale's cloud infrastructure if you just want a turnkey solution, and it's very inexpensive. And then lastly, any cloud. We run on top of Google, we run on top of Amazon, we run on top of Azure. So all of the major third-party clouds are supported. And last but not least, we also sell appliances. So if you just want to sell paired appliances and, and go active-active replica between the two of them, you can do that also. Uh, I also often get asked about encryption and security. Uh, can, how should, why should we trust Infrascale with that data? Like, I mean, you know, I don't want your employees to be able to see my data. And the good news is my employees can't see your data. Uh, we use a technique that's called double-blind encryption, where, and this is how it works. It's modeled on the safety deposit box of a bank. Before data leaves your office, it gets encrypted with a key that you know and I don't know. Then it gets sent over an encrypted tunnel. This slide says SSL, but it's actually TLS now, which is more secure. It gets sent over an encrypted tunnel. It arrives at my data center, and I encrypt it again with a key that I know and you don't know. So that data is sitting there with two encryption wrappers around it. So to crack that data, 
you would need to social engineer hack me and social engineer hack you to unlock that data. The chances of that occurring are very, very low, right? So in security, there is no silver bullet. There's no way to be perfectly safe. But following this double-blind encryption approach geometrically reduces the risk uh, of somebody actually cracking open your data. Now, if Sony had been using double-blind encryption, if they'd been using InfraScale, Sony would never have experienced that incredibly embarrassing breach. If, goodness, if John Podesta had been using InfraScale and had been encrypting you know, his email, then these WikiLeaks sort of disclosures wouldn't be occurring. Um, so it's amazing to me that this isn't just standard in the industry, but it's not. So when you're talking to backup and disaster recovery vendors, ask them this simple question. If I lose my key, can you give me the data back? Like, you know, if I'm stuck. If they say yes, run in the other direction, right? The answer should always be no. Uh, the answer should be this is based on a shared nothing infrastructure, right? If, if their response basically boils down to trust me, don't work with them, right? Because you shouldn't have to trust anybody with your data, right? It should be properly encrypted so that no one can get access to it. Because if, if your vendor can get access to it, it's only a matter of time until the wrong people get access to it. So that's the encryption side of things. Now this then means um, that we work with some of the sort of most hardcore customers in the world. So, you know, uh, we have police departments all across the country. The Department of Justice is a customer. Uh, hospitals all over the country. Banks all over the country. We're HIPAA compliant. We're SSAE 16 compliant. We comply with the EU direction, uh, data protection directive. We're Sarbanes-Oxford compliant. We can go on and on and on. So some of, some very serious people in very serious lines of work trust InfraScale with their data and their systems because of the built-in security. And I dare say this is probably one of the reasons why AVG, one of the world's greatest security companies, chosen for scale to be a partner in backup and disaster recovery. Um, this slide just is sort of just talking about the scale of the solution. We're currently protecting a million devices, where a device is usually a server, virtual machine, uh, across 50,000 customer accounts being served by 900 partners. We're exclusively a channel company. We only work through the channel, uh, so we'd love to work with you. Um, and... Uh, Oh, before I go on to the next steps, I'm just going to go one more slide. So here's, um, I like this slide. Here, here's a few cu additional customers. Um, University of Virginia, we talked about PricewaterhouseCoopers, the global accounting and technology firm is a customer of ours. Pepsi, you've probably heard of them, a customer of ours. Lockheed Martin, who make fighter jets and satellites, is a customer of ours. The American College of Surgeons. Um, so if we can handle, you know, the, the back of a disaster recovery workload for these folks, I'm, I'm guessing we can probably do it for you as well. And we'd love to talk to you about that. To that end, I want to promote to you a product deep dive demo we're doing next week. And this is um, for the more technical among the audience, where we're really going to go into the product. We're going to simulate some failovers. It'll be run by our sales engineers. Uh, so you can really go hands on with the technology. And also, of course, we can get you free evaluations, send you an appliance out so you can play with it on-prem, all sorts of different ways to engage with that technology. Um, and you can find more. Uh, about that at infrascale.com slash events. That's infrascale.com slash events. And so that actually brings me to uh, the end of the webinar. We're going to do the Q&A now, and then shortly we'll announce the, the prize winner. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left here, and I've just got my last poll that I'm putting up on the screen. Excuse me. Would you like to learn more about Infrascale's backup or disaster recovery solutions? Uh, yes, I'd like to learn more, or a polite no, maybe later. And with that, uh, Andrew, I will throw the ball back to you for the Q&A. Thanks very much, Ken. Um, so I read the deck before I attended the presentation this morning. And I've still got half a page of notes based on what you added in. So thank you very much. We do have a bunch of questions, so uh, we'll get started. ABG offers their own backup solution. How effective is their backup um, over InfoScale? Is ABG Shadow Protect uh, not as effective? So the ABG backup solution is actually us. Um, so we're, we partner with ABG to build that out. Um, so if you're using that solution, you are using InfoScale's solution. 
and there's and there's uh, sort of different levels. So um, this is probably with you're probably a cloud care partner, I'm guessing. Um, so if you're using the, the cloud backup module in cloud care, that's a great starting point. Now, if you've then got some more um, more so heavier requirements, we can then move you up to some of the other solutions that AVG and Emberscale together sell. So you can talk to your AVG account manager about that, getting access to some of the cool stuff I was talking about today, like Cloud Boot and the anomaly detection. That stuff's not built into the Cloud Care module. Um, and, but just talk to your AVG account rep about this. Ask about Infrascale and the two companies partner very closely and it's all integrated. So uh, even if you're using Infrascale's products, it, it very nicely integrates into the AVG suite. Andrew, would you add anything to that? No, uh, that, that's it exactly. Uh, it's kind of a trick question in that you provide the goodness on both sides of the equation. Uh, the next <laughs> question is, should we arrange a demo with your team for our end customers as well, or would AVG do that for us? Either or. If you've got a tight relationship with your AVG guy, do it that way. Otherwise, you can contact us directly. Either way, both companies are going to know that you're interested and both companies are here to help. Um, so it's really, it's really up to you. You know, if you, for example, let's say you come to the webinar next Thursday with the sales engineers and you do the demo and you see that, um, AVG is going to know, you know, we're going to tell them that, et cetera. So think of us as one big continuous group, if, you, if that makes sense. We are AVG's exclusive backup and disaster recovery partner. Um, so whichever is easier for you, I guess, is the, the, is the short version. Okay. Um, next one is, can you have a central device that you can back up to from other clients? Absolutely. Yeah, so many of our MSP partners do this, um, have a multi-tenant back-end secondary that, you know, they're sucking data in from multiple client sites. There are a lot of different ways to deploy it. Um, Pretty much any configuration you would want, we've already done. So we have a thousand partners or 980 um, active partners, you know, and everybody's got a slightly different configuration. So it's highly customizable. And uh, again, the product deep dive would be a great place for you to learn more about that. Okay. It says uh, next question is about the encryption. It says the data is encrypted 256-bit uh, while in transit. What is the encryption at rest in your cloud? Is that also 256, um, or is it a different encryption? Well, there's a, the answer to that's slightly complicated. Uh, the, the, the encryption that's done client side prior to send is symmetric AES 256 bit, which is the uh, the NIST recommendation for top secret government data. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, or put another way, CIA level encryption. And on the back end, we use asymmetric encryption algorithms at 1024 bits. So remember that double bubble I was talking about earlier, sort of it's inside two encryption wrappers. So we actually use different algorithms for each. Okay. Um, what is your secret encryption key? No, just kidding. Uh, next question is, are you going to be covering the, the pricing of your services? Hmm. Happy to. Uh, so, this um, is a question we had this morning. So I think this is contact your account manager because your results may vary. That's right. Your results may vary. I will say this: very inexpensive. Um, although we have, you know, awesome technology, we are uh, le we're less expensive than Storagecraft or Datto or, or others. Um, so we pass all of our savings on to our partners. Uh, our partners generally make 30, 40, 50 percent margin on our products when they sell them. So it's very margin rich. It's very affordable for you very affordable for your customers. Um, we, of course, have far more functionality and power than a Datto or, you know, or a storage craft, uh, but we've deliberately priced it very aggressively for the channel because we don't want to have 988 partners. We want to have 9,000 partners. Okay, perfect. Um, please explain boot from the cloud. Yeah, so cloud boot. So we, you know, Probably the year is about 2011 or 12, and we were very much just focused on backup at the time. And at the time, we were a, a storage craft partner. Um, and our eternal frustration with storage craft was how heavy their images were and how cumbersome their solution was and how there were all these different bits and bobs I had to integrate. And I said one day to um, a young chap, Derek Wood, who, Andrew, you may have met. He's now our field marketing director. Uh, wouldn't it just be awesome if I could just just magically boot my machine in the cloud. Because frankly, when my system melts down, I don't want my data back. Like it, it's nice, it's better than not having anything. 
But what I really want is I want a new magical computer to appear that not just has my data, but has my applications and everything and is running. And it was actually kind of a joke inside the company for six or so months until some of our engineers said, well, why couldn't we do that? And so we embarked on a journey that led us to 18 months ago release Cloud Boot. And Cloud Boot is exactly what it sounds like. Run InfraScale on a computer, protect it with InfraScale. And if that computer blows up or is stolen or is hit by ransomware, you can boot that machine in the cloud within 15 minutes. And to me, that is the absolute holy grail of data protection. Why would you stuff around with backup when you can have a solution that will give you back a running computer perfectly configured in the cloud in 15 minutes guaranteed? So that's what cloud boot Perfect. is, Andrew. Uh, next one, why would we choose a draft solution versus purchasing the appliance and paying monthly for it? Oh, we still call that DRAS. It's all DR as a service in our book. So we have offerings where for, you know, $150 a month, we'll give you all the hardware. Hardware's just free and included. We, we've got software only options. We don't think the appliance is important. I know others like Unitrends and Datto are big on appliances, but to me, that's silly. Um, it's like, you know, when, when you buy Verizon or Comcast, you get a box and it's in your garage, right? And you don't really deal with that. You get another box and it's in your living room under your TV. But you, do, you don't think to yourself, oh, yeah, I bought a Honeywell, you know, Fiber 250 modem and I bought myself a such and such set-top box. You don't think like that. You, you bought the Comcast service and with it you got all sorts of amazing capabilities. And yes, there is a piece of hardware under your television. And yes, there's another box in your garage. But that's not what you bought. This is how InfraScale approaches appliances. We will sell you an outcome. We'll sell you our DR solution. And if that needs some hardware in your office, we'll give you that hardware for free. Put it in there, we'll maintain it, we'll replace it. And it's just part of the service we deliver, if that makes sense. I shouldn't say for free. It's um, built into the service offering, is what I should say. Okay, good. That sounds more like the marketing answer. Uh, next one is, I think we'll answer this during the presentation. Does retention count towards the total space on pricing? No, it doesn't, and that's quite unique. You know, with our cloud backup, we eat the versioning um, and maintain, maintain that unlimited history for you. It's probably one of the, the biggest selling points of our cloud backup solution, I think. Uh, certainly, it is for me, and that means you can roll back to any point in time. So, you know, I show off a little in my demo when I roll back to 2012, and that's a bit extreme, um, but you know that is just built in, and, and InfraScale bears that cost. Okay. Um, when do you recommend to use DRAS for cloud backup to protect against ransomware? I always recommend DRAS. It's a little bit more expensive. Like you should talk to your account manager about uh, pricing, but it's roughly speaking $100 a month per terabyte for cloud backup and roughly speaking, $130 a month um, per terabyte for DRAS. So for that extra $30, I would go DRAS all day long because your recovery time is 15 minutes guaranteed. Okay, uh, do you have, does Inverscale have Canadian data centers? You mentioned North American, but do you have Canadian data centers? We have one Canadian data center, yes, in Toronto. Okay. Um, and you answer this one. Do you back up and check VMware-based VMs? Yes, I saw the VMware logo that you backed those up. Um, Absolutely. Are you a channel-centric company? By that, I mean, do you Exclusive. sell direct and do I need to worry about you cannibalizing my plans? Uh, we're channel. exclusively channel. 988 partners uh, only work through the channel. You'd never have to worry about us selling direct. We even have deal registration, so if you, there's a couple of hospitals in your neighborhood or something that you want to bags or, you know, call dibs on, you can do that with us. Um, and so, uh, yeah, very much committed to the channel and very eager to bring more partners into our network. So if, if you're on this call and you're listening and, and you are an MSP or, or a reseller or uh, technology provider, we'd love to talk to you about our partner program. Okay. Uh, next one's competitive. How do you compare against Datto? Datto is a really terrific product for environments with between 1 and 15 or maybe 20 employees. So if you have an all Windows environment or maybe, you know, one SBS server or something like this, Datto is 
uh, terrific. Um, where data starts to get into trouble is when they go outside that box. So things like the cloud boot I was talking about, booting in five, you know, in 15 minutes, that's not something they're going to be able to give you. Um, if you had 50 machines or 100 or 200 and you wanted to boot all of those at once, that's not something they're going to be able to give you. Uh, Unix, you know, they don't support Unix. Uh, their Hyper-V and VMware support is sort of barely there. So, again, phenomenal product for that sort of 1 to 20 seat environment. Um, above that, I'd recommend you look at a, you know, a SunGuard, um, like an Inmarge, us, obviously, I'm, I'm biased, uh, a Unitrends, sort of the, the more sort of business-focused solutions. Okay. Um, how many data centers do you have? Fifteen worldwide. But, but remember, we also work with Azure and Google and Amazon. So we've got our 15 plus those entire networks. And I actually have forgotten how many that is in total. I think they forget probably the total number of locations you can choose is up to like 37 now. Okay. Um, given that you can host our company's data, are we able to set up an infrastructure in the cloud for our customers, or are there plans to offer that for use in the future? I'm not, not sure I understand the question. Infrascale. I think that's more of an infrastructure question than an infrascale or ABG question. Um, oh, like a host, like okay. he wants to host other stuff in the cloud. No, we don't do that. Um, we can, I mean, we can refer you to people who will help you with that. But if you're talking about hosting stuff in the cloud, that's not the business we're in. Okay. Um, do you do you offer trial versions to try your software? Absolutely. Um, so, and if you're interested in this, just type it into the questions tool. Just sort of put your email address in and um, say, look, I'd like you know any of the following. We can send you uh, an NFR unit so you can play with you know sort of our hardware on prem. We can set you up with a pure cloud offering on software. We can get you into our dashboard and our portal and our partner resource center. There's a whole lot of different ways to engage with that technology um, that are that it you know that are all really cool. Um, I, if I were you, I'd probably start with a call with one of our sales engineers, and then I'd be like, "Hey, look, I want to install this in my office. I want to play with this, or, or whatever." But there's a lot of different ways to get you know, get this technology in house for free uh, for, for partners. Um, very much so. Okay. Our uh, next question is: How does recovery to site take place? Uh, recovery back to site. Well, uh, so it depends which what you're doing. If you're in cloud backup, it's what, what you'd expect. You sort of right click what you want to recover and click recover. Um, if you're doing DRAS, normally you'll run in the cloud for a while. So you fail over to the cloud, you'll run in the cloud, run in the cloud, run in the cloud, and then once you've got your office ready to go again, you'll normally, you know, Friday night, you'll schedule some downtime and then just suck everything down from the cloud back to your on-prem location. So. Um, a lot of people ask me about this, why can't I automate the failback on-prem? And my answer is, well, you can, but it's not a good idea. Um, uh, when there's a disaster, seconds and minutes count in terms of getting back up online. In terms of failing back to your on-prem environment, that's not that urgent. You know, you can run in the cloud for a week or two weeks. We don't charge you for that, by the way. That's included. Um, so you, you can schedule that fail back and do it at a time that is going to be least disruptive for you. Okay, next one's about partnering. You've mentioned partners several times. Do you offer market development funds for your partners? We do. So we offer a few different things. So we offer uh, MDF, so we will pay to run marketing events in your territory. So, you know, we can put on a stake and learn at a Fleming's and you can get all your clients in and we'll send a rep and you're there and our chap will say a few words and you say a few words and we train them up. Uh, we can do webinars like this with your customers. Uh, and again, we'll provide the marketing dollars to run that. We'll, we also provide sales incentive dollars where actually we will spiff your sales reps. So your sales reps are out in the field selling stuff and you're paying them, you know, you're, you're paying them a salary and a commission. If they sell InfraScale product, we'll actually throw money on top of that. And there's two things you can do with that. You can either A, um, you pass that money through to your sales reps, or B, you save yourself the commission you would pay them otherwise. So it's a really terrific program for business owners and MSPs and uh, small resellers. So, both, so long story short, both MDF, marketing, 
dollars and sort of SDF, sales commission spiffs and dollars. Okay, I show us at the top of the hour, I've got one last question. Uh, would your product be cost effective for a single server customer? Absolutely it would, yeah. Yeah, so we're cost effective from one server up to 200 servers. If you've got 2,000 servers, I'm not your guy, but if you've got between one and 200 servers, I'm relatively confident that we're the best solution you can buy right now. And that's the end of the questions. We're at the top of the hour. Um, Ken, if you could please check the chat window. I believe Dean has uh, identified the winner for asking the most questions. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, that's right. We're giving, let me, uh, we'll just change the slide as well here. So the lucky winner of his choice of either the Xbox One, uh, the Apple TV, or the Parrot Drone, all three of which are fantastic toys, is from SIS Computers Incorporated, Matthew, hmm, I'm probably going to mangle this, Blernowitz? Uh No. Bl Andrew, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> it's Matthew from SIS Computer, it, Computer Incorporated. Down, so, so email is going to work pretty well. Uh, thank That's you, everyone, congratulations, everybody Matthew. who attended. There will be a follow-up email that will give you all the links, will give you uh, access to the recording. Thank you very much, Ken. Delightful as always. And I'm looking forward to uh, part two and three of this three-part series. Thank you very much. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, everybody. It was fun to be here. Cheers.